The America's Democrats podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to americasdemocrats.org and click donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. And if you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus, and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. And we say hello to Phil Kiesling, who was Oregon's Secretary of State from 1991 to 1999, currently Director of the Center for Public Service at Portland State University, and he is the leading advocate for voting by mail. Phil Kiesling, thanks so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Delighted to be here, Jim. And we're very happy to have you with us. You know, as a state legislator in Oregon, you were against the idea of people voting by mail. Then, as Secretary of State, you became an advocate for it. What changed your mind? Well, I hadn't thought much about it. In 1989, I was a freshman Democratic, uh, newly elected representative from Southeast Portland. And I instinctively kind of said, you know, I like going to the polls. I would call it the crunch of autumn leaves argument that all of us on one day go down and the weather's nice and we see our neighbors and we say hello to the poll workers and do our civic duty. I love that. But When I got to become chief elections officer, two things really quickly uh, came to the fore. One was that uh, uh, this method significantly reduced costs. Uh, You didn't have all of the poll workers to pay for. You didn't have to set up uh, all thousands of, of precincts all over the state. But even more important than that, the turnout effects were dramatic. We first started doing it in in non-general elections, special elections, school board, bond measure elections. And we went from single-digit turnouts to um, 30, 40, 50 percent. It it literally had a, a tripling or even higher in terms of turnout. And I came to the conclusion that we were confusing a particular ritual of democracy, a well-loved one for sure, but with the essence of democracy. And the essence of democracy is participation. The notion that our system functions best when as many people as possible get out and weigh in. We don't always win. Our candidates may lose or they may prevail. But if we're engaged the system works better because, in a sense, we hold each other accountable for it. And even back in the 90s, um, uh, turnout was beginning to decline, and the problem has just gotten worse since then. Right now, only Oregon, Washington, and Colorado allow voting by mail. Why is it only in the West, and what are the prospects for adoption in other states? Well, I don't know what it is about the West. I mean, I think in some ways we're not as tied to to tradition and ability at times to be more innovative in terms of, of policy to ask the question about why do we keep doing it this way, especially when the results are more and more disappointing as they have been with, with turnout. I think also, you know, uh, Western states often have a lot more people that don't affiliate with either political party, although in the Northeast you have that as well in places like Massachusetts and New Hampshire now as close to 50 percent are registered as non-affiliated. But um, I think that it can happen anywhere. I mean, one of the one of the arguments I hear over and over again, and I just think it's it's groundless, is oh well, maybe in Oregon or Washington or Colorado, you're also squeaky clean out there, and you know anywhere else, of course, you'd have massive fraud and it'd just be a disaster. Come on, you know we can play hardball out here in the West, along with the the, the best of them. People have strong strong feelings. Um, uh, you know, the, the fraud argument has just become a, a you know, a will of the wisp. Um, uh, the, the lack of any real evidence for it is uh, is huge. Um, but I think that uh, I think it's just tradition. We're so used to that. Uh, I call it the fifth century B.C. business model of ballot delivery. You know, you have to go 
somewhere to get your ballot. And in fact, even the term vote by mail is misleading. I realize 20 years after calling it that, that it really more precisely is something akin to universal ballot delivery by mail. And this is a subtle but very important point that I think once people grasp will make it easier to to take it more seriously. This system doesn't require anybody to, quote, vote by mail. Yes, you can return your ballot with a 49 cent stamp and it's very convenient costs much less for a lot of people compared to driving or the child care costs but you can also walk it into a drop site you can go to the county courthouse you can go to one of hundreds of special places set up across oregon now washington colorado and physically deposit your mail see your neighbor say hello even sometimes get one of those nice i voted stickers to wear so it it's it changes the step two of the ballot process. If you look at an election system and the and the voting act as four steps. The first is registration. Step two is connecting with the ballot. Step three is actually marking it. And step four is returning it back. Okay. What this system does is changes the dynamic at step two. It just says if you are a registered voter, it is government's obligation now to get you your ballot. You can then return it, step four, and three and four market and return it however you want. Okay, Most people do it at their kitchen or dining room table. Um, and again, most people mail it back, but in some elections, most people walk it back. But it's up to you to do that. But it's now government's job to connect your ballot to you, not the other way around. And I think when people kind of grasp that, it's going to going to change their thinking, especially given that in every state we already have that anyway. It's known as absentee ballots. Um, uh, uh, so this is less a, a true revolution than it is a natural evolution of some patterns that already exist. To what extent does voting by mail increase turnout, and is that turnout more progressive or more conservative? Well, those are two very separate questions that are important to look at in turn. First of all, about overall turnout. Um, I think the evidence is compelling, uh, and it fascinates me that people who kind of just don't like it are almost do analytical somersaults to try to prove that what's obvious on the face of things somehow isn't <laughs> the case. So let's look at 2014. Now, now this system, which I call universal uh, vote by mail, this system by definition will have the least impact in a presidential race. There's so much else going on to try to get turnout up. People are obsessed with it. By the time this is over in November, you know, everybody will probably be called about seven different times, if not more. It's more powerful in a midterm election, and it's even more powerful in a party primary election. Now, now let's look at midterms. In 2014, if you just look at the active registered voters in America, about 175 million of them, the turnout was 48 percent of the active registered voters, okay, and that's not even counting the people that aren't registered at all, and, you know, it's 36% when you throw those in, but let's just look at the people already registered who are active, okay. In the battleground states, the dozen, you know, 15 or so states that everybody said were, you know, close Senate race, close governor races, and the Democrats, by the way, lost virtually every one of those, the average turnout was 53% of of active registered voters, about 5% higher than it was across the across the nation. In the three universal vote by mail states, it was 65.7%. Wow. I mean, it's okay. And you go, well, whoa, 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 whoa. there must have been some really, really hot races out there in Oregon, Washington, Colorado. True in Colorado. Colorado had a tough Senate race and a tough governor's race. And it was prominent, and they did this system for the first time, and they had record turnout. In Oregon, nothing. There wasn't a, any kind of battleground state. The Senate race was a 20% blowout practically. The governor easily won re-election for the, for the third time. And in Washington state, they didn't even have a Senate or a governor's race at all on the ballot, okay? And so here you have this dramatic – uh, increase in, in, in the midterm. If you think about this, if the country had averaged even that 65% and Washington's a lower rate pulled it down, Oregon and Colorado both had 70% versus the 48% national average. But 
at 65%, if everyone had averaged that, we would have had 30 million more ballots cast. Rather than 83 million across the country, we would have had in the country 113 million ballots cast, much closer actually to the presidential turnout rate. In fact, Oregon's active registered voter turnout in its midterm with no real contest in the ballot was greater than the Register active registered voter turnout in most states in the 2012 presidential race. Now, just think about this. Now, in the primary election, which is you know the far and away the least studied, the most ignored, and the most important election in many respects, 90 percent of our congressional and state legislative races get decided in these party primary elections. The turnout in these elections, it's about 18 percent. 18 percent of the registered voters on average are participating in these elections, which really determine, you know, the vast majority of of these offices because of the way districts are constructed. Some of that's gerrymandering, but most of it, I believe, is how people have decided to live in in those patterns. Oregon exceeds 40 percent when you look at it in terms of the act of the Democrats and the Republicans who are eligible to vote in these primaries. We have a closed primary state. So, you you know, we have roughly double the turnout in these primary elections, and and a much bigger uh, uh, turnout than in the than in the midterm elections. And uh, so, on the face of this, again, I think this is compelling evidence. Now, the the second argument you mentioned, I'll get to this briefly. What's the makeup of that electorate? It has been a constant refrain among progressives who have criticized this system that even if it increases turnout. It's going to be the wrong turnout. Oh, my gosh. You know, mail ballots are, 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 are the preference of older, whiter, suburban and, yes, Republican voters. We did some research here at the center of some graduate students to kind of start looking at this question and particularly around the issue of, of age. And we were able to get complete voting records from about 20 states. We'd like to get more um, as we can. But what was interesting is in the 2014 midterm, the state that had the highest percentage turnout of 18 to 34-year-old voters, that group that the Democrats just salivate over, and I understand why, because of, of how strongly they lean Democratic right now, no state had a higher rate. We had almost 46% of those turnout of the registered voters, and many other states, most states were in their 20s, 20%, for example. There's another piece of research that Matt Barreto, a, a professor out of uh, UCLA, has done about Latino registered voter turnout, not citizen eligible, but actual registered voters that that he and others have identified as being Latino. The average in 2014 among the 25 top states that he studied, 30 percent. In Hmm. Oregon and Colorado, 55 percent, nearly double. Okay. So part of what I think is important is progressives to actually look at the actual numbers. Don't look at the surveys. Don't look at census data, which is really, really subject to big, huge errors. Try to look at the actual turnout data of actual voters who are registered and eligible in states like Oregon, Washington, Colorado. And it's not necessarily that this size of the electorate is going to always be Democratic. Let's remember Young people voted for Reagan more than they voted for Carter back in in 1980. These things can change. Okay, right. old people used to be part of the Democratic coalition. The, you know, you always count on them now. Of course, they go almost 20 percent Republican in in midterms. We've had huge shifts, and at the end of the day, it's about turnout. Period. And though I'm a Democrat, I personally believe that getting higher turnout is just more important in and of itself. But right now, the evidence is that if you move to universal vote by mail or ballot delivery, it's not only going to dramatically increase turnout, but it's going to increase turnout, especially among the younger and more diverse minority voters that are out there. Now, we're speaking with Phil Kiesling, former Oregon Secretary of State, currently the director for the Center for Public Service at Portland State University. 33 states in the District of Columbia have adopted voting before Election Day. Why do you think that's so much worse than voting by mail? Well, you know, in the absence of other alternatives, early in-person person voting is better. It extends the franchise. People are busy work days, so if they're not forced to go on a Tuesday but can instead go on a Saturday or Sunday, that's better. Here's the problem, though, with early in-person voting. 
once you go down that road and a quote and, and essentially double down on the traditional notion that the polling place has to be the center of the electoral universe, that it has to be the default method by which you deliver ballots to people, you actually put a huge barrier up to, to, to just shifting gears and abolishing the polling place. I would argue that as odious as photo ID laws are, and I hate them, there's a clear strategy going on out there to use ridiculous trumped up arguments about fraud. We had 12 cases, I, I, I think, out of 100 million ballots cast. That's literally, you know, six zeros and a one to the seventh side of the decimal point. OK, but as much as I hate those laws, I'd argue that the biggest single obstacle and the voter suppression a device in a sense is the requirement that you have to go to the polling place to get your ballot. And so progressives who I, th I think are well-meaning about that and have been supporting it. Um, uh, and to them, it's often an alternative to absentee, more absentee ballots because they go, oh, absentees are usually used by older, whiter conservative voters and at least early in-person voting, more minorities, et cetera. So we like that better is they don't understand and grasp that by doing that, you're basically locking yourself into an old business model that is going to keep disappointing you. The data on the actual turnout in early in-person voting states, North Carolina, Texas, um, um, even Illinois does a lot of it, Ohio, New Mexico, is really disappointing. Actually, in 2014, they averaged even lower turnout than the national average for the most part. Okay, wow. and And – and it's more expensive. You're putting more cost burdens on local governments. And again, there's inequity there. What are the local governments in America least able to absorb much higher costs of running their election system? You know, local governments in inner cities and rural, you know, poor rural areas. Sure. You know, well-heeled suburbs can afford to invest in the new equipment and the upgrades, and a lot of these voting machines are a disaster waiting to happen, as reports by folks like the Brennan Center have pointed out. And you can decide to spend billions okay, to upgrade these machines – and double down on the polling place, yes, and keep them open even more days prior to elections and all of that. But my argument is just cut the cord. Just say, wait a second, every registered voter is entitled to get his or her ballot delivered to them personally via the mail, and they can then decide how they want to return it. Now, souls to the polls, of course, the big rallying cry for early in-person voting in, in, in states, particularly among the African-American community, boy, that resonates. You know, come to church on Sunday, and then we'll go off to our respective early voting polling stations, we'll cast our ballot. And often, of course, they then wait in line for a couple hours and have to show photo ID. Now, souls to the ballot drop sites may not be as resonant a phrase, but think about it. You encourage people to, yes, come to church on Sunday. Yes, come with their ballots in their pocket or their purse or wherever, filled out. And then they can just go to any drop site, right. the most convenient one. They don't have to go to the place that you know maps back to the precinct because they've got their ballot already. This makes so much more sense. And, and, and those who advocate more early in-person voting, um, uh, I think somehow think that – uh, you know, that this ballot delivery method that universal vote by mail promises somehow is 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 not going to work. And they're not looking at the evidence. And instead, they're they're in a sense burrowing even deeper into a into a model of how you deliver ballots that I think is, is proving bad for democracy. OK, Phil Kiesling, former Oregon Secretary of State, currently the director of the Center for Public Service at Portland State University, talking today about voting by mail. Phil, thank you so much for your time with us. We do appreciate it and look forward to having you back again here on America's Democrats dot org. Thank you. You're quite welcome. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly netcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen to this AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. The problem with our so-called free market 
is that it's not free for you and me. It's largely controlled by monopolies, which are free to inflate prices just because they can, letting gougers gleefully extract unwarranted monopoly profits from us. This milking of consumers by tightly consolidated industries is propelling today's surging price hikes. Brand name corporations claim they're being forced to mark up price tags just to cover rising costs for raw materials, labor, transportation, etc. But in a competitive marketplace, they'd have to eat much of those increases by taking a bit less in profits. Indeed, monopolies are now raising prices simply to squeeze even greater profits from hard hit consumers, a game of corporate greed that socks America with more inflation. Consider diapers. A year ago, Procter & Gamble announced that the pandemic was driving up its production costs, forcing it to raise prices for its Pampers brand. At the time, it had just posted a quarterly profit of $3.8 billion, so P&G could easily have absorbed a temporary rise in its costs. But instead of holding the price to ease their customers' economic pain, the conglomerate used a global health crisis to justify upping diaper prices. Six months later, P&G's quarterly profit topped $5 billion. And in that same quarter, P&G spent $3 billion to buy back shares of its own stock, a Wall Street manipulation that artificially bloats the wealth of top executives and other big shareholders. In short, P&G used the excuse of inflation to inflate the price of their diapers, then used the extra money it extracted to inflate the value of its stock to benefit rich shareholders. This is Jim Hightower saying, well, couldn't consumers just switch to Huggies, the brand sold by P&G's main competitor? No, for it's a co-monopolist, having also goosed up its prices. Howdy ho, folks. Thanks for tuning in and sharing my weekly commentaries. Also, please join me for a live web show I host every other Tuesday, the Hightower Lowdown Happy Hour at the Chat and Chew Cafe. You can join the action live online as I chat with grassroots leaders and progressive sparklies from around the country. Go to HightowerLowdown.org slash chat and chew to find out about upcoming guests and watch past episodes. That's HightowerLowdown.org slash chat and chew. This social security measure. I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care. This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, Welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security, and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing or one time in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America. Whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job, that's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. And we say hello to Amel Ahmed, an associate professor of political science at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and author of Democracy and the Politics of Electoral System Choice, Engineering Electoral Dominance. Amel Ahmed, thank you so much for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure to have you with us. And Amel, you recently wrote a piece for the Washington Monthly titled Why We Should Rethink Voting Rights from the Ground Up. And you point out that we tend to think about voting rights as a negative right. What does that mean and what makes it, as you describe, faulty? Well, I think um, you know, thinking of voting rights as a negative right essentially puts us in the framework of protection from harm. And those are the kinds of demands we make of the state to protect us from harm in exercising our right to vote. Um, and it comes down to protection from intimidation, obstruction, um, and all those things that, that would uh, make the franchise less equal. And that's, of course, really important. Um, but in that piece, what I'm trying to do is, is trying to reimagine what it would look like if we thought of voting rights as a positive right. And that would take us away from protection from harm and put us more in the framework of making demands on the state that empower us with the resources we need to secure our well-being. 
So it makes it you know, more of an affirmative right to vote. Um, and I think that's something that is very much lacking in, in how we approach voting rights in the US. And I think that has a lot to do with how voting rights have evolved. We have no right to vote within the constitution. That has never been the case. Um, there have been attempts to, to establish it, but they've, they, they've not been successful. And subsequent efforts to assert a right to vote um, have usually referred back to the equal protection clause. Um, and so again, that's really making demands that the state protects us from discrimination, making sure that we have equal access to the franchise, um, but it really is silent on whether or not we are actually able to act, to, to exercise um, that 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 right, and so that is what I am hoping to do by moving this into uh, a different framework where we think of it as an affirmative right, and we we think of the state as as uh, providing for our welfare rather than just protecting us from harm. And you would think that that would be something that everyone could agree on, and sadly, it's not. In fact, you argue that a truly progressive agenda would treat voting rights like economic rights. So what's the benefit in this approach? You know, I really like economic rights as a framework for many reasons. Um, Number one, because economic rights are also not guaranteed in the Constitution. Um, But it gives us a model for how something that we don't have any, you know, constitutional guarantee for, we can still make these demands. And it really, uh, you know, economic rights have been hard but hard won through advocacy, through mobilization, social movements um, that have increasingly made clear the costs of not having these rights and and built up a consensus that this is something that we are owed just as a condition of human welfare. And given how important voting rights are, I think we can also shift to, to a similar framework. Um, I think, you know, I also appreciate the economic rights framework um, because it taught, it thought in terms of how to bind politicians to specific outcomes and not rely on their own sense of fairness and political efficacy. And I think that's a really important way to, to approach this. There are many principled politicians who are committed to voting rights advocacy and the protection of, of rights. But to my mind, that is not a stable basis for something that's so essential to our democracy. Mm-hmm. And, and right now... Voting rights advocates are pushing for the passage of uh, passage of uh, H.R. 1, the For the People Act, as a way to protect elections. What do you see as the limits and possibilities of this act when it comes to an affirmative right to vote? Well, I'll say, you know, first of all, H.R. 1 is a kind of massive, sprawling bill with lots of uh, things within it. Um, many of those things still are within the framework of negative uh, liberty. And, uh, you know, the, the negative rights are important. Protection from harm, protection from discrimination are still critically important. Um, so that's a part of H.R. 1. But it really it goes beyond this, I think, in, in really useful ways. So provisions such as introducing automatic voter registration, uh, secure mail-in voting. And there are many uh, tweaks to election administration. They seem like minor tweaks, but but they actually really help improve and streamline in-person voting. And so, you know, when you think of this as a, a positive right, I actually think of really concrete mundane things. I think through my own day, I think through, you know, you know, elections that that come and go. And I, you know, this is, I'm someone who was very well versed in electoral politics and, and in voting rights. Um, and it's hard for me to keep up. It's hard for me to integrate it in in my daily activities, and I'm constantly surprised that uh, you know local elections, which are critically important, um, I'm. It's hard to get information about what's happening. It's hard to even keep track of the deadlines and registration. And there, there are lots of things about voting that are complicated and confusing, even if you're paying attention. And so I think of this really in very concrete terms, how to make it easier for people to get the information they need and to get out there and and, and really execute that right that they have in reserve. I think one of the major limits of HR1 is that, you know, I, I think the framing doesn't give us a sense of why all of these things are coming together. And that's been a limitation. It seems like, you know, a whole, you know, array of things that um, I think it's been described as a, as a wish list for, for voting rights advocates, but it really shouldn't be. If we can understand it in terms of what is required for voting rights as a positive right, it makes a lot more sense why these things are being brought together. And so I think it's really important uh, that we consider the you know what's happening at the level of political imagination 
in addition to the practicalities and the logistics. People need to be able to make sense of why these things are being brought together. Um, and I hope that we can articulate this more clearly as a push for an affirmative right to vote, not just the defensive posture that we often take. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned as H.R. 1 is this massive bill with all sorts of things about it. it does it make sense or, or or is it maybe this the only way to get any sort of uh, election protections passed? But does it make sense to to then just do a standalone all by itself? Here's what we have to do. Streamline how people have the right and get to vote. Or or is that an impossible task, given how so many people seem to be against letting people have an easy way to vote? I think I mean, I think I would absolutely um that would, in my mind, be progress if we could just figure that out. But one of the biggest challenges uh, for the US is that our election administration is so very decentralized. Uh, so even streamlining that process is, uh, you know, that would require its own 700 page bill. So there are things that unless we're willing to, to establish some kind of agency that's paying attention to this, it's going to be very difficult. Um, and, and we really don't have a central agency that, that's managing this. We, we approach voting as this kind of um, laissez-faire enterprise where different uh, localities are managing it in different ways and different individuals are, are responsible for providing their own information, collecting their own um, uh, resources and, and figuring out how they're going to get to the polls. And so, you know, one of the things that really struck me in the past presidential election 2020 is how much we did to help facilitate voting given the conditions of the pandemic. And it made clear how much support people need on a regular basis. So we did it because the pandemic pre presented all of these obstacles. But I think that is a model for us going forward, not just for the pandemic, but for all times, because it made clear just people need a lot of support to do this, even knowledgeable people who are paying attention and care about this and, and want to you know, um, exercise their, their, their civic liberties. People need support. And I think that's a model for how we can move forward with it. We're speaking to Amel Ahmed, an associate professor of political science at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and author of Democracy and the Politics of Electoral System Choice, Engineering Electoral Dominance. Amel, if, if government were to take an aggressive approach to affirming the right to vote, what would that entail? So I think there's a lot that could be done to make an, to, to take a more aggressive approach. Um, but I will give you just one that I, I would start with, and I think this would be critical. I would start with giving people time off to vote. I think this is a, you know, a, a structural feature that makes very clear how, how much of a laissez-faire approach to voting we have. People have to carve out their own time before work, after work, during work. It's managed privately. It's managed by each individual according to their own ability. Uh, it should not require that much work. So they're, you know, require employers to give people time off to vote. They are not required to vote, but if they choose to do so, they should have the time off to vote. Um, and I think in addition to removing the logistical obstacle, this one change, and it, you know, it would be a significant change, but I, it does so much more because I think um, it helps to signal to people that this is an event and it's, act, it's an activity. It's a reminder, we have time off to vote. This is, it, it's a reminder that this is happening. And more than anything, it, it makes voting more of a communal act, which I think has become less and less the case. Um, it's become more of an individual activity, a private activity and less of a public event. And so I would love to see legislation that uh, required employers to give employees time off to vote. Mm -hmm. You specifically highlight the work of Stacey Abrams. Why did you choose to focus on her? I think, I, you know, I recalled um, hearing interviews that, that she had done. And I remember thinking how lucidly she combined the framework of voting rights advocacy with the framework of mobilization. And that to me is really just the, the perfect marriage that there is no voting rights advocacy without thinking through mobilization in terms of how to empower people, how to get them 
there, not just remove obstacles, but how to get them there. And it's not just her. I think a lot of organizations, a lot of voting rights groups do this organically because they realize that it's an extension of what they do. But she made it very explicit. And she said, it's not enough to focus on discrimination. And I think it's absolutely right. It's not enough to just focus on discrimination. You have to help get people there. And I think it's important um, because there are nefarious obstacles that we know about that, that try to prevent people from getting to the polls. But beyond that, there are many obstacles that just exist naturally. Um, even where there's no concerted effort to deny access, the whole system seems to work to deny access, to, to, to put you know, the cost of voting uh, higher than, than it should be. Um, it, when you think through what people have to figure out just to make sure that they're, they're going to the right place and they're registered and they've done everything that they need to do, logistically, it becomes very difficult. Now, I, I really value Stacey Abrams and the work she's doing and her whole advocacy network was, was really impressive. Um, but I think even that has its limitations. And this is why, again, I think of it in terms of rights. This can't fall to private adv advocacy groups. And increasingly, I think it falls not just to the advocacy groups, um, but to political parties are in charge of that kind of mobilization. Historically, we've had lots of groups that were involved in, in that kind of mobilization. We've had labor unions, we've had you know, religious establishments, we've had all sorts of um, groups that were involved in, in facilitating mobilization and, and helping people get to the polls. As those institutions has, have atrophied, we rely more and more on parties, Sometimes these advocacy groups, but their reach is rather limited. So most of the mobilization that takes place is taking place through parties and more specifically through campaigns where it's very strategic and very limited. And there are many people who are never going to have anyone knock on their door or, or give them a phone call to remind them to vote. I don't think this can be entrusted either to private advocacy groups or to campaigns. Moving ahead, where else do you see the efforts taking place and and who do you envision can be effective in moving us toward a more encompassing embrace of voting rights? You know, I think it's going to um, it's going to come down to social movements and whether or not we can build enough of a social movement. And this again, I go back to the example of, of economic rights. It wasn't any single group. There are lots of lobby groups and, and advocacy groups that were involved in this, a lot of politicians, but it was really a coalition. And that coalition started with the idea that this needs to be a right and it has to be secured and it doesn't matter if it's in the constitution. Um, and I, you know, I will say there are people who are pushing for a constitutional amendment and I completely support that, but we don't need to wait for a constitutional amendment. I think it's really about changing the frame and for all of us, changing our ideas of what we can demand of our government. And it begins with that initial step to say, you know, we, we can demand more and, and we don't have to just take this defensive posture and be on our heels. Um, it, can, it can be more of an, an affirmative push, but I think it will take a social movement. I think it will take a, a coalition of um, politicians, activists, advocates, and, and everyday citizens saying this has to happen. It's a shame that this is such an ongoing uphill battle. Um, you know, if if <laughs> why people have to try and restrict others from from voting is beyond me, other than they don't believe they can win if they don't. And that's absolutely wrong. You know, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think it's those threats that keep us in this defensive posture because there is a lot to defend against. That is absolutely for sure. But I think this is not a winning posture. I think if, if we really just keep playing defense, um, it's going to be at our own expense. And really, it's, it's time to go on the offense, which is hard to imagine given you know, everything that's happening. Um, but it's time to, to, to really think more aggressively and more proactively about how we can think through this whole system and not keep finding ourselves in this same position over and over again, you know, throughout the past decades of US history, uh, voting rights advocates have found themselves in this play, same position of playing defense, litigating egregious acts piecemeal, focusing on individual cases, because we don't have a framework to support the whole system. And so it seems like a tough time to be thinking of that when we're still playing defense on so many different fronts. But I think this is exactly the right time to be moving in that direction. 
Absolutely. Amel Ahmed, Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, author of Democracy and the Politics of Electoral System Choice, Engineering Electoral Dominance, joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Amel, we would love to have you back again with us soon. Thank you very much. I would love that. Thank you for your time. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen to this AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. Let's start there with Ukraine as the Secretary of State and the, and the Secretary of Defense actually sat down this past weekend with the president of, of Ukraine in Kiev. Uh, how significant is that, Joe? Well, it's enormously significant. First of all, it's courageous to be able to do something like this. You remember just uh, two months ago, the U.S. was offering Zelensky, President Zelensky, rides out of Kiev. <laughs> right. And now we're sending officials into <laughs> Kiev. And they came with uh, not just messages of uh, you know encouragement, but eight hundred million dollars of new aid for the first time. A very large uh, component of that is heavy combat equipment, artillery, and armored personnel, vehicles, and tanks. And also with a diplomatic message, uh, somewhat uh, caught caught us by surprise that the U.S. is going to open up the mm -hmm. embassy again. And we expect U.S. diplomats to be flying back this week and the embassy itself to open up in the next couple of weeks. And, and finally, it was just this message of the future, it's particularly the one that, that Austin delivered, Secretary Austin, when he said that the, the goal was to weaken Russia so that they couldn't do anything like this again. Well, that's an expansive goal that goes beyond just just uh, defeating the invasion. It, it gets to the, the post-war future with Russia. And he's, he was really putting a stake in the ground about where the U.S. wants to go with this conflict. So back to the diplomats. So we will have um, the, not only the staff returning, but also for the first time since, uh, what, three years uh, 20, US, 2019, yeah. A U.S. ambassador in Ukraine. So is this a sign that we believe the war is over? No, no. It's a sign that we're, we just, we've we determined, I think, that, that Russia is not going to win, mm -hmm. that they're not going to win this war. And nobody knows where this is going to go. Uh, is it going to be weeks, months? Some people are talking about years. You could have a low-grade, grinding war go on like it has and since 2014 in the Donbass region. You could be seeing this for quite some time. But that it's, it's, it's secure enough and, you, and the Ukrainians have built enough of a barrier to the Russian military advance that you could maintain normal, well, mm -hmm. diplomatic relations with right. Ukraine again. And they appointed a very capable career diplomat, a Bridget Brink. You notice this probably isn't one of the posts that the political donors are hankering <laughs> for. You know, when you really need an ambassador, you go to the career service people. Well, that's what yep. Bridget Brink is. And she's going to move over from the, um, the embassy in Slovakia to go to Ukraine, hopefully as soon as as soon as the next next couple of months, if the Senate can expedite the confirmation. So, Joe, it's been two months since we first talked here with you on the Bill Press Pod about the war in Ukraine, uh, which started on February twenty four. Uh, what what's the status today? It certainly has changed since we talked a lot since we talked two months ago. Well, it's a war now full of questions of Russian capability. It's clear that the battle for Kyiv is over and Russia lost. They tried a, a lightning blitzkrieg-like assault, very ambitious, but one that on paper looked like it would be easy for the Russians to conduct. They tried to encircle and take over Kyiv. They failed. 
They were beaten back, you know, within the first few weeks. It was clear they were not going to be able to do this. It took two months for the Russians to recognize they weren't going to be able to do this. And now they're regrouping in the Donbass region. Remember, that's in eastern mm-hmm. Ukraine and southern Ukraine, where they've had a presence since their invasions of 2014. And but he, and, and they've been amassing troops. They've moved about 75,000, maybe as much as 90,000 troops there. And they're approaching it differently with a more methodical advance, heavy armor uh, preceded by heavy artillery and missile fire. Uh, but, you know, it's been going on for about a week now. And again, mm-hmm. it's a little surprising. It's not moving quickly. The best description I've seen is, a, you know, a grinding slog. Which means, and then you keep hearing the phrase fierce fighting. That means the Ukrainians are holding the Russians. The Russians are, are gaining ground, a village here, a village there, but not rapidly, nothing strategic, nothing like the pincer movement that's been predicted where they would try to envelop the defending Ukrainian forces by getting around them. So it, it's not at all clear that, that Russia can win in the battle for Donbass e- either. Well, are you surprised that that uh, this has lasted so long, and why has it? What you know, what are the factors that have um, surprised all of us? I guess. Well, oh, yes. Yeah, so we're, we are. There isn't a military analyst on the planet who thought this was going to happen, right? Okay, right? Because on paper, it, it's it's overwhelming. You're the. This is the third or fourth, depending how you count, largest army in the world. It's been it's spent decades on modernizing. You know, since Putin came in, he has been spending money not just on nukes, but on everything to build up the Russian uh, military force. The Ukrainian army um, is is small by comparison. Ukraine spends one tenth on its military compared to Russia, and it's been disorganized until recently. You know, it's only since 2014 that the Ukrainian army has recognized how weak they were and started to rebuild. So this is stunning, and it shows there's some long. There's some things going on that have long-term implications. For example, the ability of anti-tank weapons to knock out tanks, tanks Mm -hmm. that cost hundreds of millions of dollars are being defeated by weapons that cost tens of thousands of dollars. The ability of them to use precision-guided ground-to-ship munitions, their their own Neptune missile to knock out the, 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 the Moskova, the flagship of the Russian Black Sea Fleet. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, and of course, the tenacity and how important it is for morale and for organization and for leadership. You know, Zelensky's decision to stay in Kiev is pivotal, absolutely pivotal. He kept together the political leadership. He inspired the population. You know, there isn't a person who could feel the gun that isn't fighting in Ukraine now. And that is what's made all the difference. And it shows how just how difficult it is for an invading army to conquer a determined op, uh, 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 civilian opposition. And we have, the United States and our allies, have been providing Ukraine uh, support, military support, cash and weapons from the beginning. But it seems recently, Joe, as I've read, that there we're, we're giving them more serious or stronger weapons. I'm not sure what the right phrase is. Um, and um, that that's made a big difference, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's that's one of the stories of this war as well, is how well President Biden has managed the U.S. response. You know, strong, determined, you know, rhetorically powerful, but ratcheting up the aid slowly so as not to trigger a Russian um, reaction that could escalate the war into very dangerous levels. So the aid now is the kind of heavy equipment that Biden himself was um, uh, hesitant to supply at first. Uh, you remember this debate goes back to Obama, who didn't want to give the Ukrainians in 2014 even sophisticated anti-tank weapons for fear of mm-hmm. escalation. So Biden provided those pretty early, but now you're getting 155 millimeter howitzers. These are long range artillery. This is the kind of thing you need to stop tank advances. You're getting helicopters, not U.S. helicopters. These are... Um, uh, Russian-made helicopters that we secured in <laughs> Afghanistan that the Ukrainians know how to fly. 
you, 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 you're getting tanks, not from us, but from Slovakia. He's providing T-72 tanks. Again, tanks that the Ukrainians know how to, how to man. And you see in France and, and UK and other now giving them heavy, heavy equipment. For this war, for this Donbass war, that's what you need. You need heavy armor to counter heavy armor. Looking back, you mentioned Crimea, you mentioned 2014. Was it a mistake to let Vladimir, to Putin get away with that without any any uh, sanctions? Yes, but that was it. Well, you know, I was on the International Security Advisory Board um, for Secretary Kerry at the time, and we were all stunned by this. We were doing a report on uh, rebooting U.S.-Russian strategic engagement when this happened. And all of us felt like, the, you know, the, we had to come to a full stop. Everything, we had to isolate Russia. And we worked on this for a year, year and a half. And at the time, all of us were concerned about not escalating this. It wasn't just mm-hmm. Obama. Yeah. But in hindsight, Yes. I would have to say we could have gone further. We we should have gone further, especially seeing the effectiveness of the Javelins and other anti-tank missiles and the Stingers. That's the kind of thing we should have given them earlier. Ukraine's military wasn't in a great position at that point, and their leadership was was relatively weak, nothing like Zelensky, but still, we could have gone further than we want. I understand Obama's caution, and, and as I say, all of us shared it, but in hindsight, yes. We, we, we could have done it differently. Well, we know that Vladimir Putin's goal, he, look, he's inscrutable for sure, to say the least. But we know his original goal was basically to crush Ukraine. I mean, he said that. It, it, yeah. it was not a legitimate country. It, it shouldn't even exist, basically, be part of Russia. He has failed at that. What's his new goal? Do we know? I think he's conceded. It's hard to tell, of course. No one really knows, or unless U.S. intelligence is even better than we think, and they really do have a pipeline (laughs) into the inner leadership, which they seem to have in the early uh, weeks. Um, It's it's pretty clear that what he wants to do in in his more limited goal is to consolidate control of, of eastern and southern Ukraine, to link up the Donbass region with Crimea, this this much talked about land bridge that would go right through the the pummel mm-hmm. city of Mariupol, and I'll, I'll allow him to 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 then move his forces further west and link up with Moldova. That is, and, and go across the the rivers of Ukraine uh, to capture Odessa and then link up into Moldova, a, a country we most of Americans have no idea where this is, right. and the and the tiny little sliver of that. Uh, that's that's pro-Russian and has about eight thousand Russian forces there already. Um, and once that happens, that could have a huge political, psychological effect on on, on NATO Europe because then you'd be right up. Russian forces would be right up against. Uh, some of the newer member states of NATO: Rom- Romania, uh, Poland, Bulgaria, etc. Is that, if that is Putin's goal, is that acceptable? Would that be acceptable to the West? I mean, what, I guess, yeah. I, I think of the question, what right do they have just to seize that territory on top of Crimea? And is that something, do you think the United States or NATO would ever accept as um, uh, a compromise? Accept? Accept? Pro- yeah, probably not. You know, we don't accept the occupation of Crimea yet. But uh, as you're indicating, many people have thought that the way this war ends is a negotiated solution that Ukraine will unfortunately have to cede some of its territory, just recognizing realities on the ground. So right. sections of Donbass, you know, maybe formally recognizing the annexation of Crimea. But why the occup well as a way to stop the war yeah you know you know and and ukraine doesn't agree to this but they've hinted that they could arrive at some sort of discussion in their official offer they talk about negotiations to determine the ultimate status of these areas so they're open to talking about this ukraine is um but but to you have to realize what this would mean you would basically if the russians if Russia succeeded in its aims to link up Donbass with Crimea and then push all the way to Moldova, you would basically turn Ukraine into a landlocked country. You'd be cutting yep. off its entire access to the sea, including very rich um, areas of uh, with oil and gas reserves. And of course, all the ports that Ukraine depends on to export its grain. So this would be lead to a tremendously weakened, maybe unsustainable Ukraine. So 
thinking it out with you right here and now, Bill, I would say, no, this is not a situation you could accept. You could not negotiate a solution that ended like that. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page.